jury selection is like curb your enthusiasm, but without cursing because people just come in and they say whatever's on their mind. And the, the, the conversations go in ridiculous directions that have no point. And at the end of yesterday, there was a guy talking about his, his public access TV show. Uh, and that's a very, that was fantastic. And he had a lot of thoughts in a lot of directions. And um, he talked about his friends in prison and like, ah, he was like, oh, maybe I don't want to even be here. Um, Devlin, and, is this guy on the jury? <laughs> this is what we no, know. no. We will never give up. We will never concede. It doesn't happen. That's exactly what it was. And you've been indicted over that? Uh, I object to you getting with it. Welcome to the newest Washington Post podcast, The Trump Trials Sidebar. I'm your host, Libby Casey, and I'm joined in the newsroom by Rhonda Colvin and James Homan. Hi, guys. Hello. Hey. We're releasing new episodes every Thursday, but we'll also have extra episodes popping up when news is breaking. It's sort of an emergency pod. That's what we're calling them. Um, and you can hear us on your favorite podcast app, whether it's Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, take your pick. You can also watch us on YouTube. Just go to youtube.com slash Washington Post. If you're wondering about our name, we're like the sister of the excellent Washington Post newsletter that you should definitely subscribe to. We all do. It's called The Trump Trials. And this is like our sidebar conversation. Um, the newsletter will keep everyone up to date on the latest of what's happening. It also looks ahead to give you a sense of what to expect next. And later in our show, we'll be talking with one of the main authors, Devlin Barrett, who's been in New York covering the first few days of the trial. But for now, it's just me, Rhonda and James. So let's get into it. We know them as juror B400, juror B280, juror B381. These are the people who've been selected so far to serve as jurors on the first ever criminal trial of a former president. We're talking, of course, about the court case that started Monday in lower Manhattan, where Donald Trump is facing 34 counts of falsifying business records. Now, this is commonly thought of as the hush money trial, but it's more nuanced than that. There's an alleged scheme to pay hush money to an adult film actress, Stormy Daniels, to keep her quiet about an affair she says she had with Trump, and then covering up those payments by calling them illegal fees and falsifying the business records. James, how did I do? And something you got that. it. You got it. There's some legal mumbo jumbo. Sign me uh, up for law school. But, <laughs> okay. But you're you're ready to you're ready to go. Okay. Yeah. Rhonda, nearly 100 people were in this first round mm -hmm. of being screened as jurors. Um, tell us about what we know of these people so far. Well, within the first batch of folks, there have been about 80 people who have been dismissed in this first few days of the jury selection process. At first, people raised their hand and said, no, I can't be impartial. I, I don't feel I can be impartial and just listen to the evidence and, you know, come with a, a decision at the end. So they were removed. And that's so but, interesting because there was no pushback on that, right, James? It was just like, if you can't be impartial, you're gone. Normally, the they would say, well, like, can you look at the facts of the case and, and the judge and the lawyers can probe right. that a little more. Exactly. Yeah. And there was, there was not th that if anything, the judge really seems eager to have opening statements from the prosecution next Monday. Mm -hmm. Originally, I think they thought that this would be a two week jury selection process. The judge clearly wants it to be one week. And as a result, I think a lot of the efforts by Trump's lawyer, Todd Blanche to sort of like disqualify people or to fight over every juror. The judge has very little patience for that and seems to really want uh, to keep this process moving. So the first test was, can you, do you think you can be impartial? A lot of people <laughs> bounced. Who remained? What are they like? Well, one of the things that I've been uh, looking at from the transcripts and what we're hearing from the court reporting is that a lot of people do feel that they can be balanced about their approach to being on the jury. That was something that was surprising. You had people who said, you know, I may not agree with him on his policies, but I think I can sit here and listen to this information. Um, we have sketches of the, the first seven who have been chosen to be seated on this jury. By uh, sketches, you mean rough outlines, not an actual right. physical sketch. We, yeah, we yeah. don't know what they look like, but we have <laughs> descriptions. Uh, for instance, we know that there is a man who uh, is originally from Ireland. He uh, said he gets his news from the New York Times and the Daily Mail. Uh, and some fox, he said. Uh, he is married and said he likes to do things outdoors. So he, you know, was one of the first like to be chosen. Like a Tinder chosen. profile. Right, right. That's exactly. Um, <laughs> Long and, walks on the beach. Right. But no pictures. Right, no pictures. <laughs> you know, and there's also a woman who uh, 
said that she is, she works in education. She's from Harlem. She said she is a woman of color and she does have people uh, in her community and family members who don't agree with Trump, but she feels she can put aside all of that and listen out the, the evidence. She also said she appreciates the way uh, Trump uh, says what is on his mind. So you have that person on here. You also have a middle-aged man from the Upper East Side who said he works as a litigator. So that's that's interesting uh, that he was chosen. He said he gets his news from us and also the New York Times. He said he is aware of Trump's other legal issues, but he feels he can uh, remain impartial until they have to make a decision. So right now the makeup is pretty interesting. And I think really the top line, and you kind of uh, touched on it is how fast this is moving. It was thought that this would take weeks, not just a couple days to get half of the jurors. Um, right now, they need about 11 left because they have to fill out the 12 seats, plus they need alternates. So we'll see where this goes, but it's moving fast. I tried to find something comparable, and of course, there's, there's really nothing comparable to this case. But if you look at the Trump Organization fraud case, that's the one that led to the CFO of that organization uh, serving jail time. That, too, took about three days for jury members to be sat on that jury, and that surprised New York media. So, you know, there, you can't really compare another case to this one, but this is interesting. And that case, too, was also uh, oversaw, overseen by Judge Martian. And so he does seem like a judge that wants to move fast on everything. Yeah. I mean, you mentioned the litigator. That is unusual. It's risky to put a lawyer on a jury. And there's a lot of lawyers in Manhattan, probably disproportionate <laughs> to elsewhere in the country. Uh, there was a, another lighter moment where uh, one of the potential jurors, a woman, was asked, uh, if she is related to any lawyers. And she said, I dated one, uh, but it turned out okay. And all the lawyers in the courtroom laughed. Uh, so it, 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 that is a risk. But remember, a prosecution needs to convince all 12 jurors of a defendant's guilt. The defense really only needs to convince one to get a hung jury, which is Trump's goal. And so the question is, of these people, uh, we, you know, some clearly are going to be more inclined to convict Trump. Some of these folks uh, might be real targets uh, to be on the fence that might be persuadable by the defense. So all told, I mean, I think it's a pretty good draw so far uh, for Trump. It, it's not as bad as I think that they had feared going in. Mm. We have a question that came from our mailbag. We'll get to some more mailbag questions later on, but this one's really relevant to this topic. Someone wrote in and asked, is it possible some of the people who did not want to serve as jurors we're afraid of reprisals for serving on the jury. Is it dangerous to be on a high profile jury like this? Rhonda? You know, I've been really thinking about that um, specifically because there is history of Trump going after people, putting their information out on social media. Uh, we should note that Trump is able to get the names of the juries or jurors. Um, he won't be able to get addresses or any other personal information. His lawyers will be able to get addresses, but he'll be able to see names. And what I'm thinking of is what we saw in Georgia. Think about Ruby Freeman and Shea Moss, you know, the two election workers uh, who were targeted after the 2020 election. He used Ruby's name. Uh, I also think about the grand jury. Can we just pause there for a moment in case folks don't remember those two women? They were working um, just... A poll regular watchers. job, yeah. yeah, poll watchers. Right. And one of them handed the other one like a candy. Yeah. And Rudy Giuliani and others perpetrated this falsehood that it was like a USB drive, and their lives were really turned upside down. Yeah, absolutely. They needed federal protection. Uh, they went into hiding. I remember when covering the January 6th uh, investigation, they testified and said they didn't even want to order food deliveries because uh, they were afraid to give their names and addresses. And they've so, gone to court over this. Right, and right. One. Yeah, and one. And one. So, I, you know, there is a precedent for the former president to target people individually. Um you know, we'll have to see. But even, you know, we get these descriptions of the jurors and you have to wonder, will their family or friends or people at work who know they're missing for six to eight weeks and they fit the description that we've all received? You know, will, will they uh, someone will reveal their uh, identity that way? I, I don't know how the judge is going to protect the jurors, um, especially in the age of social media. Um, and I think it's a real concern that we'll just have to see. But yes, to the reader's question, there is a concern about being on high profile cases. Yeah, I mean, the names are legally under seal. So if Trump did sort of name the jurors while the trial was underway, there would be very serious legal repercussions uh, for him and his lawyers. Uh, it, it, the kind of how much information do you need to identify some of these people? Manhattan's obviously very big. 
a lot of people, this happens in every jury trial uh, that's big, is they just are too busy. Uh, there's a lot of people, you know, like a teacher who doesn't want to miss class or someone, a, a doctor who uh, said that it would take him away from his patients for too long. And that's a valid reason to be excused. And honestly, in most cases, most Americans don't actually want to do jury duty. Uh, uh, you know, they see it as a chore or a hassle. Maybe this is kind of a, a different case because it's unique and so high profile. But there are a lot of people who I think the judge has been willing to let go because you are really basically signing up for what could be like a life altering thing for some of these people where you're going to get notoriety and attention, potentially attacks. Uh, and there was a way for them to get out of service. Though, exactly. And the judge said, can can you be fair and impartial? They could raise their hand and say, I cannot. I'm one of the folks who has to go. And that wasn't probed or pushed. There was none of that pushback to say, all right, are you just trying to get out of jury duty? Do you have safety concerns that we can address mm -hmm. and help you feel safe? Like there was a way that people could get bounced. Um, and oftentimes it could be harder to get bounced from jury duty, uh, really. Yeah. yeah. I mean, intimidating a juror is a very serious federal crime. You know, it's a it's not something, <laughs> uh, you know, I, and we'll see in this case, there are obviously a lot of wacky people out there. Well, it's not just Donald Trump. It's going to other people exactly. His, take the evidence, the, right. the the little, we're compiling these portraits, as you said, Rhonda, of these jurors, because we need that for reporting purposes to get a sense of the demographics serving on the jury, to get a sense of who's making these decisions. But there is some information that we're not going to share because it would be too easy to identify or pinpoint them. But that doesn't mean that other people will have that same degree of responsibility. Mm -hmm and ethics. So right. yeah, there is information out there. Let's talk about our word of the week. And yes, it's Thursday and we already had one word this week. Our prior <laughs> word on Monday, our inaugural show was voir dire. It's really a phrase um, talking about this process that, that jurors go through of questioning. Mm -hmm. Rhonda, you reminded us that that meant speak the truth, tell the truth. Now we have a new phrase today to dig into. It's Antomarchy rights. James, named, what is this? <laughs> named for Domingo Antomarchy, who was a, an alleged drug dealer. Uh, he was convicted and his conviction actually got thrown out on appeal because he wanted to participate in the sidebars as his lawyer was questioning potential jurors. And the judge said, no, you don't have a right to be up there. And the appellate court said, no, you have a, a right as a defendant to be part of the whole trial and the whole case. And so Trump, it's rare. Most people don't go participate if you're a defendant in these sidebars where the jurors being questioned by the defense attorney and the prosecutor and the judge to follow up on things. Uh, Trump said he wanted to do it. Then after a so day, he was asserting his so he was asserting rights. his anti marquee rights. And then after a day, he he changed his mind. <laughs> And I mean, it is kind of onerous. It's also I'm only laughing because it, it's a it's a fairly exhausting process. It is. Like you're up and down, you're at the bench, or it's a little legalese. It can be interesting stuff too, but it's it's and it's more logistically challenging because it's you know the former president, so he has a Secret Service detail right. wherever he goes, yep. the Secret Service goes, and so you're cramming together. His detail is standing there. Everyone, the former president, is feet away from you. Obviously, it can be super intimidating for these people who've never met a president before. These people, you mean the jurors? Or the jurors. The juror is there. Yeah. Usually the lawyers would go up, they might have some follow-up questions. But in this case, if Trump goes up as well, you're like answering specific questions, maybe about your personal life, your dating of a lawyer. Uh, what or medica what, what you medications you're yeah. on? That yeah. was one of the jury questions is, um, do, are, do, are you taking any medications that might uh, prevent you from focusing? You know, talking about your medical history in front of Donald Trump, that would be awkward for anyone. Uh, so Trump yeah. said he wanted to assert this. And right? then and changed yet. his mind. And then the judge, Mershon, um, actually made him sign a piece of paper on Tuesday saying that he's now waiving his antimarchy rights. And these are rights specific in New York State. Yeah, this was a New York appellate case in 1992. Yeah, that's so interesting with the Secret Service aspect of it, because do those rights extend to them? You know, they will have to all get up <laughs> and listen in. Uh, so that that alone, again, underscores how we're in uncharted territory. I here. imagine all the places Trump's detail must go. <laughs> That too. Any, any detail at all. Any detail at all. Um, well, this gets us also to Sidebar, which is the name yeah. of our, our podcast, yeah. um, because, you know, Sidebar is part of this, right? Yeah. You go up for the Sidebar with the judge. Also, you know, Sidebar, here we are having a conversation. So has dual meetings. And in a courtroom, uh, you know, when I did jury duty, when they would have Sidebars, they would play a white noise machine. It'd be like, <sighs> so that you couldn't, as the jurors, you're sitting there and you couldn't hear them, you know, 20 feet away having the conversation. But for our audience, hopefully there's no loud, scratchy 
<laughs> well, so you'll be able to hear us loud and clear. <laughs> Let's hope so. You're listening to the Trump Trials Sidebar, and I am pleased to introduce our next guest, Devlin Barrett, reporter and co-author of the OG, the original, the Trump Trials newsletter from the Washington Post. Hey, Devlin, thanks for joining us. Hey, how you doing, Libby? Good to be here. Well, I am well. I'm wondering how you're doing. Um, the marathon has just started. You're in mile, like, 0.5, basically, <laughs> of the marathon. How are you holding up? Uh, good. They're long days. I, I, I won't say I'm not very, very tired by the end of the day. Most days start at 7 and end at 10, 30, 11. Uh, but uh, it's very interesting. I love court. I love trials. Uh, I am... I am I am having a great time. Yeah, you're like a very tired pig in mud, I think is the, is the <laughs> saying. So Devlin, you know, court does not sit on Wednesdays, but it's sitting Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. We don't know yet if there'll be a break for Passover. Is that right? I don't think they are going to okay. break for Passover. The judge has basically said if a juror needs that, we will do that. But no juror has asked for or indicated they might want or need that. So it's looking like we are not going to take a Passover break. Tell us where you are in the in the courthouse and, and explain the setup of how reporters are getting in. Where are you actually sitting? So it's a little complicated, uh, but essentially, it's, and it, it, there's, it's going to be very different between jury selection and the actual trial. So I'll explain what's happening in jury selection right now. Because you need to put 96 human beings, potential jurors, into the courtroom uh, at, a, at one time, you can't, f those people fill up all the benches in the courtroom. There are a lot of benches in this courtroom. One of the funny things about this trial being held in a very old, beat up courthouse is that old school courthouses tend to have very big courtrooms. So from a reporter's point of view, it's very good to have a big courtroom. But in a voir dire, it doesn't help you much because the potential jurors all use up that space. So that being said, what they what they do for jury selection is they have a pool of reporters that sit in the back of the courtroom. It's only six reporters, um, and they each have you know we we worked it out. We have different assignments um, for each reporter to focus on a different thing, so that everyone, all the reporters, can get a, the, as the best possible picture and understanding of what's happening in the courtroom. So that's what's in the courtroom. Then down the hall, same floor you have what's called, what reporters tend to call the overflow room. And what that is essentially a, an entirely separate courtroom, again, pretty big, which is a good, good feature of these old courthouses. And that's where, you know, a hundred or so reporters watch a video feed um, from the courtroom that's just down the hall. Um, and, and most days that is very full. It's, it's especially full on Wadir because there, again, there is no seating or there is very little seating for reporters in the courtroom proper. So essentially you have this balancing act between a small number of reporters in the courtroom of a much larger number of reporters in, uh, the, the overflow room. And do you want me to explain the reporters in the hallway or is that too much detail? Absolutely. Uh, Give it to us. Okay, so between those two places, there is a separate little batch of reporters, which um, folks who have been following the coverage have probably noticed that Trump often speaks in the hallway outside uh, the courtroom. And so there are there are basically a half dozen reporters there. Uh, they're principally uh, photographers and, and video folks, um, but there are some, you know, old fashioned talky, you know, scrubby print reporters like myself. Um, who stand there to get whatever statements Trump wants to make going into and out of court. And the reason for that, it, it, it all, it, this is all built around the uh, essential logistical problem that a Trump trial creates, which is there are rules and procedures and practices for how to do a trial. But when it's a very high profile trial like this, when, it's, when there is an incredible uh, public interest and an incredible number of reporters who want to cover it, you have to come up with logistical solutions to the way these trials would normally work. So normally what would happen is a defendant is allowed to talk to reporters if they choose to in the hallway outside court. To facilitate that without creating essentially fire hazards and security hazards and just like making everything a mess, they said, okay, fine, we will have a dedicated space for a small number of reporters to talk to the defendant if and when he chooses, and we'll just keep a, you know, we'll carve out a little space in the hallway for that so it doesn't become unmanageable. So all, a lot of these moves and these things I've just described are done to try to manage the intense interest in all the people that come along with a trial of Donald Trump. 
Where have you been so far? Where have you been stationed? So on Tuesday, I was in the pool in the courtroom uh, for the morning session. The other times, uh, we really only had two days of, the, of what you would call the, the jury selection process. And even one day, the first day of jury selection, there were so many legal arguments that we really only got about two hours of jury selection in the afternoon. So uh, like I said, Tuesday in the, in the courtroom itself, and then Monday in uh, the, the what's called the overflow room watching the feed. How much can you see the defendant Donald Trump? And talk to us about reports that Trump appeared to be falling asleep in court. So this is one of my uh, favorite pet obsessions of covering trials. So I before I became a house cat uh, DOJ reporter where I didn't get to go many places or do many fun things, I was a court reporter for many years, and I spent most of my time in trials. And one of the real challenges of covering a trial is determining when certain people are doing two things, sleeping or crying. And that is always something of a judgment call. Sometimes it's very obvious, you know, if a person's like head like falls back, you hear them snoring, <laughs> I think we all understand that's sleeping. And if someone has, has like, you know, lots of water that's coming just <laughs> under their eyes and not anywhere else on their face, that's crying. But there's a lot of, frankly, gray area in between. Um, and I have seen lawyers not off in court. Uh, I have seen jurors many times not off in court. And I'm pretty sure, although they would all deny and I won't name any names, I have seen judges occasionally not off in court. Um, so I think this, this question of is Trump falling asleep or has he come close to falling asleep, there definitely seems to be times uh, so far where he is fighting sleep, let's say. That's, that's, how, that's my you know, uh, reporter shorthand. Or when someone sort of like the head starts rocking a little bit and it's not clear that they're actually following the, the tennis match of the conversation. But um, so there is definitely an element of that. I will say that's pretty far, few and far between so far. And, you know, as exciting as this trial is, as, as much as geeks like myself are, you know, interested in all the minutia of this stuff, um, court is also boring sometimes. And it has, there have been boring stretches already. Um, and I expect, I have every expectation that even with something as big as the Trump trial, we will also see boring stretches going forward. Let me pause Devlin with his courtroom reporter's hat on and turn to you guys who have political hats on. I mean, one of the reasons why this is interesting is because Trump has been slamming Joe Biden as quote unquote, sleepy Joe and try, even though they're very close in age, trying to make a meal out of Joe Biden's age. Um, so that's, Part of this, James. I mean, I, I wonder because he's some of these truth social posts Trump puts up are pretty late at night. You know, you do wonder how he's sleeping. You're on trial. Your theoretically liberty is at stake. Uh, it, I do think that that you kind of do wonder like what's going on in his head. And obviously, the or if boring staffers part are doing or the, staffers are doing the, are the doing posts. The posts and, yeah. But it does. Uh, it is one of those things where like how much impact does it have? If you know, it it, it maybe it narrows the divergence where it it is striking in polls how. How many people say Biden is too old to be an effective president compared to Trump? It's like twice as many people say that about Biden as Trump. I'm not sure this really like changes that dynamic fundamentally, but maybe it 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 sort of does. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is interesting that if this was a televised uh, jury selection and we saw the the nodding off, uh, if if Biden would use that, because of course, as you mentioned, that is what Trump has been saying. He said it a few days right before going into this week, uh, talking about Biden's age and that he can't put sentences together. And like you said, Sleepy Joe. I've also been wondering, too, and I, I don't know if Devlin has insight on this as someone who has been a court reporter. How do lawyers feel if your client is nodding off? I mean, that that can't be uh, a great thing for jurors to look at the defendant and who isn't even engaged. I don't know if that plays into any of this, but I do wonder if you have a sleepy defendant, if that at all influences jurors in uh, their decision. Yeah, Devlin? So I, I think it certainly can. I will say that times that Trump has seen most um, engaged, in danger, oh, most in danger of falling asleep, okay. I would say the opposite of engaged. When, yeah, have been not right. Exactly, have been the times when when the juror, juror, the potential jurors are not there, when the lawyers or the judge in particular is just going over what is essentially like rote legal instruction. Um, I, I will say, having covered. Trump's uh, trial earlier this year in federal court, the civil E. Jean Carroll case in which he was sued for defamation. One of the things that's really striking to me about how Trump interacts with jurors in that trial, and I think, I think you're starting to see a, some of these flashes already in this case, is that so far Trump as a defendant only has two settings, bored and angry. 
And mm -hmm. honestly, I think most lawyers would tell you neither of those are great settings for a defendant. And I will say also, you know, Trump is many things, including a politician, and Trump has political skills. And one of the things I keep waiting to see is Trump start to try to use some of those political skills in the courtroom. You know, he uses them outside the courtroom all the time. And he does have, you know, sometimes like a kind of a wry sense of humor, maybe a cutting sense of humor. But moments of levity in court are, are very meaningful. Jurors don't generally understand the law. Jurors spend so much of their time and energy focused on the human behavior, and they pick up so much. I, I, I'm always amazed at how well jurors tend to track the human interactions, even when they can't hear the sidebars, like you guys say, even when they can't understand the legal issues that are sort of like swirling around them, and they don't get to see the hearings where the parts of the hearings where the lawyers yell at each other or the judge yells at the lawyer. Like they don't get to see any of that. But I'm telling you, jurors are so smart and canny on this. It's it's almost like that one sense of them is heightened because they don't have the the ability of these other to see these other parts. So they focus so much on the human behavior. And in that context, this 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 by this only two settings problem of angry or bored is is not a good look for a defendant in general. Most lawyers would tell you that you want a defendant who is more sympathetic, more charming, um, even if it's charming in a gruff way. You know, a lot of these potential jurors have said he we love how he takes control of a room when he walks in. We you know we kind of dig his like celebrity vibe, and that could work for him. But he doesn't seem to be using it much so far. Uh, but it's very early. Like I, I, I could, I could totally see him trying to turn on that switch at some point. Devlin, what's the vibe or the tension or lack thereof right now between Trump's legal team and the judge? We know that they've really butted heads in the preparation for this trial. Can can you feel that tension in the courtroom, or are things sort of running smoothly? No, I think. <laughs> The answer, sadly, is both. Things are running smoothly <laughs> because the judge is forcing them to run smoothly and quickly. Uh, but the judge clearly is also already fed up with Trump's legal team and snaps at them on, if not a daily basis, then pretty close to it at this point. And so I think one of the challenges for Trump's defense is they are starting this process, you know, sort of a bit in the hole with the judge and and sort of the the, the bad kids in class. And that's that's going to be hard for them. They, I, I honestly would be a little surprised if they climb their way out of that hole. I think they may just have to to fight this case from the posture of the judge being mad at them, because I, I, I would be a little surprised at this point if that changes. Tell us about the jurors and how much access you have to them. How much can reporters see them and hear them? Do you have a sense of who and what they are? Well, the voir dire process where the lawyers question them and they talk about their views, that, that's where we get the most sense of them. T to be honest, um, I, you do, as a reporter, you can run into them in, in the hallways, in the building. I am always very careful because that can be a real problem for people. You know, one of the things, one of the things that I think jurors sometimes have a hard time with, to my point about like human behavior views, is that lawyers and participants in cases are always told, if you run into a juror, in the hallway, in the cafeteria, and on the street, in the subway, do not interact with them. Like, don't smile at them, don't wave, don't like crack a joke. Like, even friendly interactions are not in the interests of the justice system. And so, you know, when I run into jurors in the building, I usually immediately put my head down and try to find someplace else to be because I do not want to um, even be misinterpreted to doing anything that might pollute the process. We've been talking about the jurors, Devlin, and how we know them uh, by things like B400. Um, why is it important to you to get a sense of who these people are and what, the, what their contours of life are, what their demographics are, what they're bringing to this trial? I'll put it this way. One, it's just interesting, right? Imagine being tasked with sitting in judgment of a former president. You know, that's, that's something that no American has ever done. Like, no American president has ever been charged with a crime, right? Well, also, no American, period, has ever sat in a jury to decide whether an American president was a criminal. That's an amazing responsibility. Uh, and I, so I think anything you can know about the people who will take on that responsibility is very important. I also think, and this goes back to my time as a court reporter, jurors are often the most intelligent people in the room. 
lawyers can learn the minutia, lawyers can learn the law, judges can, you know, run a run a trial, run a room. But I can't tell you how many times I finished covering a trial and you go and talk to a juror in the hallway and you start asking them questions and their first three answers make you realize this person understood this case better than anyone else in the room. Mm -hmm. This person really chewed on all the facts and really came up with a way of thinking about what happened allegedly, uh, although after a verdict, it's usually not allegedly anymore, um, what happened. And they understand it in a way that no one else does. And maybe not even the defendant does. And, and maybe not the prosecutor, the judge, or the defense lawyer either. And I, it's one of my favorite things about covering court is getting to talk to the jurors after. And I, whatever happens here, my, my fondest hope is that many of the jurors talk in some form, because I would love to know. And, and the, the answers will be I, I, I'm so sure the answers will be incredibly interesting. You laid out so well what's happening inside, but I've been curious about outside of the courthouse because I know the former president and some of his aides over the weekend called for people to come out and show support for him. Is there any energy of uh, the pro-Trump supporters out there or is it just like a few people with, you know, MAGA hats and, and signs? So there was a fair bit of that when he was first indicted and arraigned. There has been very little of that so far. I will tell you that the, the public tends not to care that much about jury selection. Like everything I've just said about how inc incredibly interesting jury selection is, I would say it's also been my experience that the public does not agree with me about any of that. So it, it doesn't surprise <laughs> we me We agree that. with you, Devlin. We agree <laughs> with you. Oh, well, that's great. I appreciate it. Um, but so there has not been much of a presence outside uh, yet. But I, I expect that to change once we get to things like opening arguments and Michael Cohen taking the stand. Like the, the intensity, the temperature, the pace, the attention is going to keep ratcheting up as we go. And obviously, we have a lot of people who are covering the trial, multiple people in the courthouse. How do you think about sort of the like the incremental updates since we don't have a live television feed and then thinking about sort of like the sweepy main story for the next day's paper? It, how does that process work? This is a little mechanical, but I think so much of trials and cover, covering trials is me actually mechanical. And so the way I think of it is one thing, like there are moments in court that are super interesting and tell you so much, right? Like there was a moment that, that we reported on where, um, you know, a, a prospective juror was asked about a fa an old Facebook post. And the prospective juror basically said, look, that was a long time ago. I wasn't saying I was, you know, super happy that Joe Biden won the election. I was just saying, look at these people celebrating on the street. Um, and Trump, when that juror was sent away, Trump, you know, sort of like gave a little smirk and a little like, sure, man. Like he didn't say that to be clear, but I think, and this is, I'm taking a little bit of a New Yorker privilege in interpreting the facial expression, but I feel like I know that facial expression and that facial expression is like, yeah, right, I bet. Um, and so little moments like that are terrific and super interesting. And I think do capture the public's imagination and understanding, even when there's not, you know, a live telecast of, of a trial. Um, but I think the tricky danger is you, you can overstate the importance of those moments. And, and so part of I think what our jobs is as reporters is to tell you what's happening in the moment. You know, this is, you know, this person said this, the judge got mad at that. Those are all important moments. And certainly people have every, certainly if I wasn't in the courtroom, I would be reading all those things because I think this is fascinating. Um, but I also think those end of the day stories, especially for court, because remember court is eight hours of a, of a, of a very technical, right. actual rich activity. And so it's really important, I think, to, to also, at the end of the day, kind of process the whole thing and try to explain the arc of the thing, because the arc is ultimately what's going to decide. It's, it's not really those little moments most of the time. Um, it's the whole big arc that's going to decide whether the verdict here is guilt, not guilty, or mistrial. Devlin Barrett, one of our reporters who's covering the Trump trial from inside the courthouse. He's also the co-author of the Trump Trials newsletter. Thank you so much, Devlin. Thanks, guys. Now let's go to our reader mailbag. Here's what one of our audience wrote in. When are there going to be consequences for Trump for violating his gag order? What if he gestures to another juror again? So first of all, tell us about what we know of Trump gesturing to a juror in court, James. The judge got pretty upset with Trump on Tuesday for basically like being audibly upset and talking while this juror was 
answering questions. Trump felt like the juror was against him. And the judge really forcefully said, cut it out. You can't keep doing this. Uh, and you could be held in contempt for that. There, there's separately from what's going on inside the courtroom, outside the courtroom, there's the gag order where Trump's not allowed, for example, to attack witnesses in the case. Uh, but there have been true social posts about Michael Cohen, who's the star witness. Uh, there was discussion. The prosecution was asking for Trump to be sanctioned for these things, uh, $1,000 for each of the posts. If, if that's the penalty, I think Trump's fine paying it uh, so that he can keep attacking away and, and showing his supporters he's a fighter. But this gets back to the real concern and fear that potential jurors could have, Rhonda, about being named or outed. Right. And that is a very real concern for uh, the people inside. Of course, the witnesses have uh, seen online threats as well. Stormy Daniels has talked about that before. And there is that hearing, as James uh, just mentioned, there is going to be a hearing on a motion that Alvin Bragg and his team filed to hold Trump into contempt for those two social posts about Stormy Daniels and Michael Cohen. He's even so gone that, after court staff and in other jurisdictions right. as well. So, yeah. so the we've seen, daughter. yeah, we've seen the behavior. It'll be up to the judge to decide, will just hitting him with some monetary fines be enough? Uh, some judges have said they would remove uh, a, a defendant like Trump from the courtroom if he would continue to do that. So it really is something that we'll, we'll be watching and seeing if he you know, abides by this uh, gag order, but we have not seen evidence that he would. Yeah, the question is just how much, do, how much, how many teeth does it have, and how much does the bite hurt? And a thousand dollars a pop is not a big bite, James. Exactly, and and it also For him. you you sort of wonder. I mean, Trump has impulse control. Uh, it, to what extent is he running some of these things? these social media posts by his lawyers, because there are a lot of social media posts that go right up to the line mm -hmm. uh, and don't clearly violate the gag order, but it would certainly seem to violate the spirit of a gag order. And I think there is understandable hesitancy to, to punish someone who's a former president, who's the candidate for president, and to deny him his right to campaign or travel around. Obviously, that doesn't mean he can say or do whatever he wants, but I think that there is extra caution to not gag the former president and an active candidate for president. Yeah. And also think about how he comes into the courthouse. He usually stops by one of the cameras and, you know, there usually isn't a microphone there. So you're always hearing him kind of shout at the reporters who are sitting there or standing there. But he's also talking, you know, about the judge there. He's talking about uh, all those involved are, you know, after him. And this is part of a witch hunt, all these things that we've heard before. But just, you know, I guess we'll all just have to stay tuned to see how he continues to, or how his legal team continues to manage him, because it is a real problem. Well, that's all we have time for today. A reminder, you can find us in video form at youtube.com slash Washington Post and on audio. It's Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Amazon Music, wherever you listen to your pods. If you want to keep track of Donald Trump's other big commitment this year, the campaign trail, check out The Campaign Moment with the Post's Aaron Blake sitting down with folks, including Martin Powers and Alahe Izadi. You can find The Campaign Moment wherever you listen to podcasts. I'm Libby Casey. Thank you to Rhonda, to James, and Devlin Barrett in New York. 